something strange happened in the woods of Washington. In 2018, there was a mysterious and unexplained occurrence in the woods of Olympic National Park in Washington State. Both scientists and park officials have been left mystified by this event, leaving us without answers to this day. In the early hours of January 27, 2018, an unexplained force knocked down over 100 trees along the north shore of Lake Keenault. Initially, the presumed reasoning was high winds or a meteorological phenomenon of some kind. After in-depth research into the weather and forecast data, there was nothing of the sort found. The fallen trees were all facing south, and the weather forecasts showed only a light breeze coming from the east that night, making wind an impossible cause. The incident was first reported by the chief scientist of Olympic National Park, Bill Bacchus. Bacchus reached out to meteorologist and weather expert Cliff Mass for his expert opinion on this strange occurrence. Bacchus described the scene as massive old trees broken off at the base and displayed in a semicircle formation. Mass looked through every piece of data on meteorological occurrences for the night before, eventually noticing that the bizarre occurrence was caused by a force strong enough to trigger a localized, systemic event that was being picked up by the sensors nearest to the treefall. The impact of the treefall was so strong that it registered as a small earthquake in the area. Mass could still find no meteorological or weather changes or occurrences at all that could explain this event. There were no drastic temperature changes, meteor activity, and the lightning detection network showed no strikes in the area. The cause was undetermined. Mass even noted in his popular weather blog, the trees fell to the south or southeast, implying an extreme northerly wind. None of the surface locations show strong wind, and most of them are easterly or southeasterly, the wrong direction. There is no strong convection or thunderstorms, so no microbursts. Frustrating, perhaps the Sasquatch or alien visitation explanations should be taken seriously. Although some people still believe it may have been caused by a shifting of warm and cool air creating a rotor effect, others have more supernatural theories, including UFOs, alien activity, and even Bigfoot. To this day, there is no determined cause of this bizarre phenomenon, and the question remains, what happened in the Olympic National Park forest on January 27th 2018. Ireland's Vanishing Triangle When multiple women go missing from the same general area, police immediately begin to suspect a serial maniac and start hunting for clues that might lead them to the bodies. However, the disappearances of eight girls within an 80-mile radius of Dublin Island were so mysterious and strange, with no bodies or crime scenes ever found, that police were never able to determine what had happened to the women, causing the area to be dubbed the Vanishing Triangle, after the similarly mysterious Bermuda Triangle, due to the fact that it really appeared as though the girls had simply vanished from the face of the earth. Annie McCarrick, Eva Brennan, Imelda Keenan, Jojo Dullard, Kira Breen, Fiona Pender, Fiona Sinnott and Deirdre Jacob all went missing around Dublin between 1993 and 1998, and police were never able to find any conclusive evidence that foul play had occurred or even a rational explanation as to what had happened. Many girls disappear as they walk through busy streets, and Deirdre Jacob was confirmed to have been seen mere yards from her parents' house, although she never arrived. However, there have been signs that pointed to something more menacing than a simple Bermuda Triangle phenomenon. A small wooden cross with Fiona Pender's name on it was discovered near the Sleeve Bloom Mountains in 2008, leading some to believe that she was buried somewhere nearby. Fiona Sinnott's personal belongings were missing from her apartment and were later found in trash bags dumped in a farmer's field as though whoever put them there wanted to create the appearance that Fiona had left intentionally. Convicted criminal Larry Murphy also lived in the vicinity of several of the girls' last known locations, but police were never able to connect him to the disappearances, although it is still widely thought that he had something to do with at least a few of the cases. The similarity of the cases also points to a serial maniac. 
as all of the women were young and mysteriously vanished, indicating that if they were abducted, that the attacker likely used the same methods. However, over two decades later, there have still been no clues that can help answer questions about the tragic and mysterious disappearances that left families with no closure or answers about their loved ones, and no justice for the eight girls who were never found. Adam Clayton Lyle Jones Missing at the Grand Canyon Disappearances of people in national parks have gained notoriety ever since The Missing 411 was published. If there is one certainty, it is that at least one person a year will go mysteriously missing at any of the 419 national parks and monuments in America, although the actual annual number is estimated to be up to 1,000 missing people. There is a plethora of things that can go wrong when visiting the vast wilderness. The cruelty of nature is no joke and many people find themselves on the losing side of a battle against survival. Many cases can merely be speculated on, and although some of these cases do eventually get solved, there's many that will remain a mystery. Though the IBS, or Investigative Services branch of the law enforcement, generally try to solve cases as efficiently and quickly as possible, this sadly is not always the case, and most often than not, cases tend to grow cold for months or years afterwards. These cases are not closed and remain open and may become active should new evidence surface. Kathy Cupper, one of the spokespeople for the IBS, has stated, It's always there on the table. Sometimes a tip will come in, someone will hear something, and it will go active again. Adam Clayton Lyle Jones is one of the unfortunate missing victims whose case has grown cold. Jones went missing on the 31st of March back in 2011 and has not been found. The man, who was only 23 at the time of his disappearance and would now be 33 years old, was last said to have been last seen by his family in the Gulf Breeze in Florida. His family claim he left home early in the afternoon in a blue Oldsmobile Delta 88 and that the only personal possession he took with him was his laptop, no other notable belongings. Little did Jones's family realize that would be the last time they would ever get to see him again. It took until the 5th of May 2011 for a park ranger to acknowledge the abandoned Delta 88 vehicle parked at the South Rim Center of the Grand Canyon National Park. At the time, Jones had not yet been reported as a missing person and therefore not initially considered as a victim. Park rangers managed to contact Jones's parents about the abandoned car, who then proceeded to file the missing person's report to the police. Contents found within the car included an itinerary of various routes of California cities and places in Denver, Colorado. Surprisingly, there was not a mobile phone in the car as Jones did not have his phone on him when he went missing. To this day, investigators have no idea whether he was lost or injured in the wilderness or if something else, far more morbid, might have happened. Furthermore, there is no actual evidence that he even entered the Grand Canyon Park, no photographic or witness proof that he was there apart from the car that was found in the car park. With so little to go off, investigators have had a difficult time finding any clues to Adam Jones's whereabouts. Peter Jackson Missing at the Yosemite National Park In 2016, an elderly man in his late 70s was reported as missing at the Yosemite National Park in California. Jackson was reported as missing in September, but his body was only found in May of the following year. His car was left at the White Wolf Campground. It is speculated that Peter Jackson was following the mist trail in Yosemite Valley when he went missing. Jackson sent his son a text message on the 17th of September confirming his location, saying he was nearly at the National Park. Peter Jackson, despite his advanced age, was said to have been in idyllic shape and health. Jackson was by no means an inexperienced hiker and, according to his son, would go for serious hikes averaging to up to five miles each on a regular basis which just goes to show that anything can occur in the wilderness and even the most seasoned of adventurers and hikers can find themselves as victims of a cruel fate. Investigators and those involved with the search for Jackson claim that he most likely left the White Wolf campsite for a simple hike when he disappeared, 
but due to unfortunate circumstances, he ended up becoming lost in the wild. His camping fees were paid all the way through to the 21st of September, implying that his stay at the Yosemite National Park was supposed to be a prolonged one. According to some experienced hikers who commented on the case on Reddit, the White Wolf campsite lies on top of the Tuolumne River close to an incredibly broad canyon, with a single way down to the floor of the valley. You can easily end up falling from the side and become trapped midway down and getting out alone would be a near impossible task to accomplish. The camping site of White Wolf is what hikers generally refer to as leave me alone campsites, as these are for hikers who wish to be left to their own devices. Many hikers claim that this area is not a place to go by yourself. Experienced hikers such as Jackson himself ought to have known this, and so the reason why he chose to go there alone is unknown. Online speculators believe that Peter Jackson might have fallen into the crevice and twisted or broken his ankle and was unable to call for help due to either losing or breaking his cell phone or having no signal. Yelling would also be ineffective as national parks are vast and you are alone with nature. Unfortunately, his case was put on hold during those crucial days when he could have been found alive due to a lack of clues and bad weather. Whether or not we will be able to find these missing individuals or their bodies is unknown. Most missing persons cases turn cold and provide nothing fruitful for months or even years. Nature is uncontrollable and all too often we forget that it can easily overwhelm us. One wrong turn in the woods can get us lost for months, one wrong step on the cliff can be our last. National parks are wonderful places to visit, though extreme caution must always be taken. We can only hope that the lost people will be found either way, so that their families may have closure at last. Project Stargate Project Stargate was the discreet name given to a CIA mission aiming to develop psychic abilities, not unsimilar to those we see Eleven demonstrate throughout the Stranger Things series. This highly secretive project was carried out from 1978 until it could no longer be hidden in the 1990s. Stranger Things fans paying close attention will notice that the Stargate mission covers the 1983 time span we know Stranger Things is set in. This project looked into manufacturing the supernatural and manipulating the human mind into gaining psychic abilities to be used in the military and for spying purposes. One of the biggest focuses for this project was the psychoenergetics. This is described as a mental process in which, through heightened cognitive abilities, an individual is capable of changing the characteristics of an item, usually its position, without physically interacting with or touching the object. Throughout Stranger Things, we consistently see Eleven, also known as Elle, move items with her mind time and time again. The researchers on Project Stargate report having had partial success with telekinesis and remote viewing. With some limited success being seen, the CIA files seem to encourage the use of these psychic abilities, but only alongside and as an informant to more concrete evidence, decisively stating that this is not definitive nor accurate enough to be a standalone sole source of evidence. What has been dubbed remote viewing has earned its spot on the show too, as we see L tune into the conversations of the Russian spies in the series, accessing a conversation she is not physically present to hear. Stranger Things is not the first media piece to portray the Stargate project on screen, with the book and film The Men Who Stare at Goats also representing subjects being asked to look at animals in an attempt to destroy them. This film uses goats, whilst we see Elle asked to destroy a cat just by looking at it during her time in the Hawking's lab in Stranger Things. Whilst the project had ended in 1995 and information was declassified and available through National Archives, these files and documents only became accessible online as of 2017. Could there be people out there who truly have mastered the abilities we see Eleven use throughout the series? Sea Creatures' Strange Circular Swimming Has Scientists Puzzled On March 18, 2021, a team of researchers published an article within the journal iScience detailing a bizarre event and the strange behaviour observed within multiple animals living in the sea. Whilst this new research is yet to reach a definitive conclusion, 
unraveling the mystery truly is exciting. Amongst this circling group are green sea turtles, tiger sharks, penguins, and Antarctic fur seals. They have been swimming in the same circular motions at a constant, consistent speed, but we are yet to find out why. Some have suggested that this could center around the navigation features that these animals have in common, namely magnetism. It was Tomoko Narazaki, a researcher from the University of Tokyo's Atmosphere and Ocean Research Institute, who first observed and recorded this unusual behavior in a group of green sea turtles. As part of her research, she had moved them away from their breeding ground in order to establish the patterns and trends in their navigation systems as they made their way home. Even though both Narazaki and the turtles knew where the group were heading to, the turtles that had been kitted out with GPS trackers found that they frequently paused their journey simply to swim in circles. This odd action was not only seemingly random, but actively hindered the progress on their journey. Narazaki said she had double-checked the data, ensuring she had read and interpreted it correctly, as she described the circling motion as being just like a machine. The data collected suggested that the circling increased as the animals approached coastal waters, close by to where they nest. One turtle we may expect to be particularly dizzy completed 76 circles back to back, with each lap of the circle taking between 16 and 20 seconds to complete. Knowing how out of the ordinary this behavior is, Narazaki reported the event to several other researchers, plenty of whom reported seeing other sea creatures perform similar behaviors when monitored using the same 3D tracking tags that Narazaki had used. Despite the pattern closely resembling one another, at this time there is no reason to believe that each of these animals' new circling habits are linked, due to the broad discrepancy in when these behaviors were demonstrated. Many circled close to their feeding grounds, such as four tiger sharks completing 272 circles near Hawaii, whereas others have circled before courting a mate. Some suggested this circling was related to searching for food, though Antarctic fur seals completed their loops largely in the daytime, despite the majority of their eating being a nighttime event. Another difference is, as mentioned earlier, green sea turtles seemingly stopped to spin midway through their travels. Whilst there is much that remains unexplained surrounding the other animals, some significant advancements have been made regarding the green sea turtles, with Narazaki explaining that this repetitive looping was usually in a navigationally important location, giving the example of them turning just before the final approach to their goal. Furthermore, it is already established that green sea turtles rely on the magnetic field as a navigation tool so perhaps by spinning in circles, they are able to assess the field from numerous directions, giving them a more informed perspective. This theory also accounts for the repetition of the action, suggesting that the same loop over and over allows for more measurements to be taken, strengthening the turtle's understanding of their whereabouts. We are yet to confirm these theories or find a general idea that can be applied to all of the spinning creatures, but this strange event has opened some new doors to some new, albeit strange, research opportunities. Annette Sayers' Disappearance On the morning of October 4, 1988, 11-year-old Annette Sayers was seen at approximately 7 a.m. standing with her dog at the school bus stop in Mount Holly, South Carolina. This was the last time that she was ever seen. When her stepfather, Steve Malinowski, returned to their home on the grounds of Mount Holly Plantation, where he worked as a caretaker and realized that Annette had not returned from school, she was reported missing. A search of the grounds and the bus stop revealed no clues, except for a hastily penciled note that read, Dad, Mama came back, give the boys a hug. That was determined by handwriting experts to have indeed been written by Annette. The strangest part of the disappearance lies in the fact that Annette went missing from the same area that her mother, Karina Malinowski, went missing from almost a year earlier. Karina had reportedly left the cabin where they lived after a row with Steve. When her boss came to check on her after she did not show up for work, he found her car parked at the plantation entrance next to the bus stop. She was never seen or heard from again, and it was presumed that she took a bus and left the family. However, Annette's disappearance and note shed new light on the situation, 
Although no other clues were ever found, some think that Karina, knowing that Annette would be waiting at the bus stop, came and took her daughter. Although there are those that have more sinister theories, Steve and Karina were known to have frequent arguments and it was said by one of their children that Steve battled various addictions. So some think that Karina may have lost her life as a result of a fight gone wrong and that Annette knew that her mother had not really walked off, leaving Steve feeling as though he had no choice but to make her write the note and then take her out too. Steve was a less than tender father figure and less than a year after Annette's disappearance, he left South Carolina and moved to Florida, giving up the two sons that he had with Karina for adoption. Police working the case do not believe that Annette was taken by her mother and have listed the case as a non-family abduction, continuing to exhaust all possibilities surrounding the disappearance of the young girl. Since that fateful day, police have looked into several leads, but there have been no other clues and the case eventually went cold, leaving locals wondering whether it was simply a matter of a mother running away and then returning for her child, or if a criminal had been living among them. Swiss couple missing for 75 years found in melting Alps glacier. Marceline and Francine Dumoulin were ordinary parents who had made ordinary lies for themselves in Switzerland. In 1942, they were 40 and 37 years old, respectively and had made a comfortable home in the Swiss Alps with their seven children. Marceline was a shoemaker and his wife Francine worked as a teacher at the local school. They kept several cows in a nearby meadow that Marceline took care of, as Francine was usually pregnant and was not able to clamber through the steep, snow-laden hills and valleys that made up the mountainous glacial region where they lived. However, on August 15, 1942, Francine went with Marceline on a rare trip to help milk the cows in a meadow above Chandelon in the Valais Canton. It was a beautiful day and the couple were happy as they set off towards the valley. Tragically, the day ended on a much darker note when the couple did not return from their chores. Their children, family and neighbours searched for them while the oldest sibling, Monique, cared for her six siblings. However, as days passed and there was no trace of Marceline and Francine, the children were eventually split up and raised by other family members, although they never stopped hoping that one day their parents might be found. We spent our whole lives looking for them without stopping. We thought that we could give them the funeral they deserved one day, said their youngest daughter. Yet the days turned into weeks and the weeks turned into years, and after decades hope was all but lost. Yet in 2017, 75 years after that fateful day, two bodies were discovered frozen 8,600 feet up in the San Floron Glacier by a worker performing maintenance on a ski lift above the Le Diableray Resort. The bodies were lying extremely near each other and had been so perfectly preserved in the glacier through the years that their 1940s era clothes were easily distinguishable. Many of their possessions were also found nearby in a similarly preserved state including their clothes, hiking boots, a hat, backpacks, a bottle, a book, and a watch. The police were notified and a helicopter arrived to remove the entire block of ice surrounding the remains, so that they could be removed without any destruction to the preserved bodies. DNA tests were performed that immediately confirmed what was already suspected. The bodies in the glacier were those of Marceline and Francine Dumoulin. Those in charge of excavating and examining the bodies for burial suspect that the unfortunate couple likely fell while climbing the treacherous glacial terrain and slipped into a crevasse where their bodies were frozen for decades in the cold, dry conditions of the Alps. The San Floron Glacier where the bodies were found is currently receding at a rate of about a metre to a metre and a half per year due to the warmer weather, and this rapid shrinking finally uncovered the bodies that had been lying beneath the hard-packed ice for three quarters of a century, solving a cold case that had long been given up on. The Dumoulin case is not the first one to have been solved by global warming either. National Geographic has reported that since 1925, 280 people have gone into the Alps and never returned, and as the ice shelf begins to shrink, some of these bodies have been able to be recovered after decades. As for the Dumoulins, their remaining children are relieved to finally have some answers. 
I can say that after 75 years of waiting, this news gives me a deep sense of calm. For the funeral, I will not wear black. I think that white would be more appropriate. It represents hope, which I never lost, reports their youngest daughter now in her 80s, and at long last, she can finally have some closure. The Battle of Los Angeles More commonly known and referred to by its nickname, the Great Los Angeles Air Raid was an incident in 1942 that led people to believe in a massive unidentified flying object sighting over the city of Los Angeles. Tensions during this time had already been heightened following the Japanese Imperial Navy's attack on Pearl Harbor, and so stationed anti-air military officials were on hair-trigger alert throughout the night. At approximately 2.25 a.m., the air raid sirens sounded throughout Los Angeles County after officials and radar control towers spotted several unidentified aircraft floating through the night sky. At 3.15 a.m., the anti-air rounds were firing into the sky, with .50 caliber machine guns and 12.8-pound anti-aircraft shells. Witness reports stated that a large, cigar-shaped object was floating through the sky and appeared to be completely unaffected by these shells as a total of 1,400 cannonball-sized rounds were fired at its underbelly. The result of the incident would end with damaged buildings, destroyed vehicles and five civilians of whom had died as an indirect result of the ongoing chaos. No aircraft was ever recovered and the entire incident was attempted to have been covered up by the United States Air Force over the following days. Today, the incident is still regarded as a mystery and experts have suggested that the cause for the Los Angeles Great Air Raid could have been due to a floating weather balloon in the region that could have caused mounted tensions to have climaxed and led to this full-scale retaliation from the United States military forces. Other witness reports directly contradict this finding, however, claiming that the main cause was due to extraterrestrial involvement and the spotting of unidentified craft in the night sky. Whatever the true cause could have been still led to the incident and is regarded with high levels of scrutiny by the UFOologist community as key evidence of extraterrestrial life. The Temple of Angkor Wat was bounded by a mysterious structure 1.5 kilometers long. In December of 2015, it was discovered that the world's largest religious monument is actually even bigger than we once thought among other brilliant insights provided by this research team. The Temple of Angkor Wat, located in Cambodia, Southeast Asia, has been thought of as the world's largest religious monument for hundreds of years, having been built in the 12th century, once at the heart of the Khmer Empire. Bringing a modern twist to this knowledge, however, is the work of a team of Australian archaeologists who have found we can actually expand the recorded size of the temple thanks to their use of ground-penetrating radar whilst investigating the Angkor Wat complex. The research mission, dubbed the Greater Angkor Project, was led by Australian researchers, Professor Roland Fletcher and Dr Damien Evans, who work with the University of Sydney. Their investigation revealed more components to the temple than we had previously known of, as well as the complex being bounded on the south side by a large structure adding to the previously recorded size of this record-holding temple. When speaking on behalf of the team, Professor Fletcher said this structure, which has dimensions of more than 1,500 meters by 600 meters, is the most striking discovery associated with Angkor Wat to date. Despite this being a fascinating finding, there is still plenty we are yet to uncover. To date, the purpose and function of the structure remains unknown and we are yet to find a parallel or otherwise similar structure in any other Angkorian works. Aside from the large, adjoined structure, the team also discovered buried towers that had been assembled and removed throughout the period, estimated to encompass the dates surrounding the construction and first uses of the temple at the Angkor Wat site. Even more new information has come to light as a result of this investigation, challenging the misconceptions surrounding the temple. For decades, centuries even, we had held the assumption that on the land neighbouring Angkor Wat stood similarly sacred precincts and cities of religious importance. However, this team has found there to be evidence of a sparse population's housing among these areas. The research team believe this could suggest residential use of the land, theories supported by the findings of roads, ponds and mounds. 
Current speculation says that these were all used by people working within the temple in positions of service, largely such as priests. Another fascinating revelation made courtesy of this project is the discovery of wooden structures having been created to secure and strengthen Angkor Wat. Archaeologists predict that these wooden structures have been implemented towards the more modern end of the temple's history, leading Dr. Fletcher to describe it as a possible last attempt at defense, an opinion expressed through his statement. Angkor Wat is the first and only known example of an Angkorian temple being systematically modified for use in a defensive capacity. The placement of these defences on a more modern timeline, estimated between 1297 and 1585 AD, suggests that the addition of the defences could have been in an effort to resist the growing influence of the city Ayutthaya, a city nearby. Dr. Fletcher summarised with the concluding thoughts, Either Data makes the defences of Angkor Wat one of the last major constructions at Angkor and is perhaps indicative of its end. This relatively recent insight into a temple so long out of use points to both the complexity of human civilization and the momentous discoveries that continue to lie ahead of us and the abundance of new leads and information to have come from one research team is a true testament to their important work. The Firefighter and the Ghost From the native Indians who settled on the plains to the unstoppable machine that was westward expansion, states such as Indiana have a rich history. Whilst aesthetically stunning, some consider Indiana rightly or wrongly to be a little, well, forgotten. Although this assumption is not exactly true, something that is undisputable is that the state has had its fair share of terrifying supernatural encounters. Much of the superstition in Indiana is based on folklore, and in the town of Gary, a belief in the paranormal perhaps now runs a little deeper after a spine-chilling event that took place in 2015. An abandoned and dilapidated town, Gary's population is small and crime rates are high. As such, old buildings are prone to setting ablaze, and the city's fire brigade are often busy. But one call-out to battle a small wooden shack that had caught fire was one that the firefighter in question will likely never forget. After taking a few photographs of the blaze for training purposes before posting the pictures on Facebook, the firefighter's family spotted something strange in the window of the fiery abode. Standing in the flames was the horrifying figure of a man dressed in black. The bizarre thing was that the house was known to be long empty, and the firefighters had not heard any signs of distress coming from the building as they put out the fire. As such, residents of Gary came to the only conclusion that they thought fitted the strange event, that the malevolent man in black could only be something from another world, namely a ghost or spirit of some sort. Of course, this cannot be verified, but in a town that has been largely abandoned, even the strangest things are not out of the realms of possibility. American Airlines reports UFO while flying over New Mexico Tall claims of UFO sightings are nothing new, especially across the American continent. For decades, there have been alleged alien sightings and diehard believers in extraterrestrial visitors coming to Earth. Recently, an American Airlines pilot has been recorded declaring that they spotted a UFO during a Sunday flight over New Mexico from Cincinnati to Phoenix, Arizona. The infamous Roswell incident also occurred around the New Mexico area, which leaves further room for debate and speculation over whether the area is a hotspot for UFO and extraterrestrial activity. Records show that the pilot of American Airlines Flight 2292 contacted the Federal Aviation Administration traffic controllers to ask them whether or not they had any targets up here. He explains he vividly witnessed something flying right over the plane. He said, I hate to admit this, but it looked like a long, cylindrical object that almost looked like a cruise missile type of thing moving really fast right over the top of us. By all definitions, this classifies as a UFO, an identified flying object. Of course, it is important to note that a UFO does not necessarily link to alien life forms, despite the vehement association between the two. For all intents and purposes, a UFO can also be a man-made weaponized plane, missile, or military object from another country potentially used for the purposes of spying. 
A man by the name of Steve Douglas recorded the transmission between pilot and traffic controllers, and it has since been confirmed as a genuine recorded transmission by American Airlines themselves, with them stating, following a debrief with our flight crew and additional information received, we can confirm this radio transmission was from American Airlines Flight 2292 on February 21st. The FBI has also been involved, stating that they are aware of the reported incident. While FBI policy is to neither confirm nor deny investigations, the FBI works continuously with federal, state, local and tribal partners to share intelligence and protect the public. This official response has caused suspicion in conspiracy and alien-believing circles online. Steve Douglas is an aircraft enthusiast and has written a book about military aircraft called The Comprehensive Guide to Military Monitoring. Douglas claims that through his research there was no sign of any possible man-made military vessel in the skies that day, and that if there had been, its presence would have been noted on the automatic dependent surveillance broadcast log. Lally Laxbergs, one of the spokespeople for the Kirkland Air Force Base, has spoken up about the alleged UFO sightings, denying all and any knowledge of such an occurrence, staring with vehement certainty that no such thing happened. Alas, many alien and UFO believers are convinced that the claims are genuine, and they see New Mexico as a staple of UFO happenings ever since Roswell. Online, many UFO enthusiasts have taken the time to state their views of it being covered up by the FBI and air bases. Douglas especially is not convinced. He even claims to have discussed the occurrence with an ex-member of the military air program who explained that in order for the pilot to have seen any object like the kind he described, it would have needed to be practically heading straight at him. The question posed by Steve Douglas was simple. If the military can't explain what it is, what's flying out there that we don't know about. Mystery Ancestor Mated with Ancient Humans The desire of Homo sapiens to mate with their archaic relatives has long preoccupied researchers. Now scientists have discovered evidence of a previously unknown human species in the genome of West Africans. Modern man, Homo sapiens, mated with Neanderthals in Europe and fathered children. This is well known. Now, a study in the journal Science Advances shows that fertile exchanges also took place in Africa between Homo sapiens and an archaic human species. Fossilized bones do not exist of this apparently irresistible human relative. Instead, geneticists of the University of California discovered traces of the previously unknown prehistoric human in the genomes of present-day West Africans. The researchers refer to this as a ghost population. The discovery provides new clues to the genetic diversity of the genus Homo in Africa, which could previously only be reconstructed in fragments from fossils. The geneticists discovered the clues to the new human species during a genetic analysis. They compared the DNA of West Africans with that of Neanderthals and so-called Denisovan humans, another species closely related to Neanderthals. Genetic traces of both prehistoric humans are found in the genome of every modern human. In the genome of some West Africans, however, scientists have now discovered additional previously unknown genetic snippets that they have assigned to the new, unknown relative. The modeling of the geneticists shows that the ways of the modern human being and the spirit relative initially separated about one million years ago in Africa. About 50,000 years ago, however, the two unequal partners met again. Researchers are still puzzling over whether the genetic traces point to a known archaic human species or actually belong to a new species. One million years ago, Homo erectus lived in Africa, presumably the first human species that used fire and could walk like a modern human. Did the ghost species resemble that prehistoric fellow? In the late 1960s, archaeologists in Nigeria found the so-called Iwo Eluru skull and dated it to be about 11,200 years old. The geneticists suspect that this human skull could have belonged to a representative of their spirit species. Dogs found roaming around near an old plant in Russia a rather strange piece of news emerged in February of 2021 that a group of blue dogs were spotted near a closed-down chemical plant in Russia. 
The factory had been out of production for six years, yet the past few months it has quickly gained a reputation for the seemingly strange appearance of blue dogs near it. Apparently, these colourful canines have been around almost since the closure of the factory, though the pack seem to have piqued the interest of the media a little more recently, following the emergence of a photograph online. It was Alexei Ganin who first posted the image capturing the blue pups that has sparked recent conversations. He shared his photo on VK, a Russian social media site. As you might expect, his post received mixed responses, from speculation to humour to concern. One user laughed about Smurfs, whilst others shot down any attempts at humour arising from the scenario, expressing concern for the well-being of man's apparently now blue best friend. Of course, in the true fashion of the internet, the demand for answers soon arose and the quest to find them began. Many have deemed it likely that the dogs were exposed to chemical residue rolling in copper sulfate, which is renowned for its blue pigmentation and is known to have been used in the factory's production. This theory is also the message being presented by Andre Mislevitz. He, the manager of the plant, agreed with the chemical residue suggestion mentioning the plausible outcome of homeless dogs having made it into one of the buildings and rolling in it once they had stumbled across chemical residue such as the copper sulfate. The thought on the mind of many is are the dogs going to be okay? Well, Miss Levitz thwarted the responsibility of the dogs from the company, denying any necessity for the chemical plant to ensure side effects are treated and the dogs return to their regular dog colours once again. He stated, I cannot bear the costs of capturing homeless animals and their sterilization. Despite the source of the issue not clamoring to find a solution, the city itself has taken an active role, aiding the blue dogs. However, this follows public reassurance that the safety of the dogs is not at risk, as their chemicals most likely are not posing a threat. When commenting on the issue, city officials said the following, According to preliminary visual inspection, the dogs are in a satisfactory condition. Their spokesperson continued to explain that the next steps in their course of action is to enter the factory, locate the affected animals, and examine both the dogs and the substance. Despite the reassurance from the city, many were skeptical regarding the claim that the dogs were perfectly healthy. One example of an animal rights activist speaking out against this issue is the Humane Society International Vice President of Companion Animals, Kelly O'Meara who referred to this unnatural colouring scenario as an obvious welfare issue. As she elaborates, Omira highlights that due to the implied close proximity, contact or possible ingestion of these chemicals, there could very well be need for veterinary intervention, without which there is risk of skin irritations, internal bleeding or death. Despite the uproar as to this revelation, this is unfortunately not the first time nor the first place we are seeing dogs with dyed fur. Other instances include blue dogs in India, a colour change credited to the illegal depositing of waste into the Kasadi River, and even green dogs reported near to Moscow. And though this was quickly deemed to have been non-toxic paint, subjecting dogs to these substances is highly unnecessary. So far, we are yet to discover exactly why these dogs turned blue, though treatment plans at the vets are proving to be promising for the health of these pups. Giving this bizarre story a fairy tale ending, two of the dyed dogs found themselves a home. As their blue tinge wears away, they will be left with loving families. Roald Amundsen Roald Amundsen was a polar explorer during the heroic age of Antarctic exploration. He played a crucial role in the exploration of polar zones and was extremely successful until his disappearance. He was born into a family of shipowners, to Jens Amundsen and Hannes Svalquist. The family was sizable, with him being their fourth son. At 15, he read Sir John Franklin's narrative of polar expeditions, which shaped his entire future. Hannah, his mother, encouraged him to pursue the stable vocation of doctorhood, hoping that he would not follow the family tradition of becoming a sailor or trader at sea. For her sake, Roald agreed and attended university for a short amount of time until his mother passed away. Immediately, he dropped out of his studies to begin a new, exciting life on the waves, joining the Belgian Antarctic expedition as first mate. Adrian de Galasha led this expedition on the RV Belgica. 
The journey ended terribly as the Belgica got stuck in ice glaciers off the coast of Alexander Island, west of the Antarctic. The crew were subsequently unprepared for the winter which followed. Due to his medical knowledge, Roald Amundsen estimated that the American named Frederick Cook had likely saved them all from scurvy by hunting for animals and giving the crew the meat. When one cannot obtain citrus fruits, fresh meat from animals who produce their own vitamin C usually has just enough of it to prevent the horrid disease. This was a realization he would carry with him for the rest of his career. In 1903, Amundsen led the first expedition to traverse Canada's Northwest Passage. He took six men with him in a vessel named Jour, which had a small and shallow draft. The ship had a small 13-horsepower paraffin engine. The crew spent two winters at King William Island, where Amundsen learned about Arctic survival from the local Netsilic Inuit population. Alongside this, he learned how to sledge dogs and use animal skins for warmth. The Jua cleared the Canadian Arctic archipelago on the 17th of August 1905, having to make a stop for the winter before journeying on to the Pacific coast. The nearest telegraph station was 800 kilometers away. Amundsen succeeded in wiring a message in December and went on to Nome in 1906. He was initiated into the American Antiquarian Society. During this time, he learnt he had a new king, Harkon VII after the dissolution of Norway and Sweden's union. He sent him news of his successes and proclaimed his achievement of traversing the Northwest Passage to be a great achievement for Norway. The crew returned to Oslo in 1906, after almost four years. In 1909, Amundsen craved more adventure, alerting his crew that they would be heading to Antarctica, planning on exploring the Arctic Basin, though he found it extremely difficult to raise the necessary funds Regardless, he set out for the south in 1910. Amundsen and his men reached the Great Ice Barrier and set up a camp called Framheim. For a while, they fared well in the freezing temperatures, with Amundsen using past experiences and Inuit knowledge to their advantage. They set out to reach the direct South Pole in October and achieved claiming the icy pole, naming their southern base Polheim and renaming the Antarctic Plateau King Harkon the Seventh's Plateau, and managed to safely return back to Framheim. His planning and skillful tactics were crucial in their accomplishment. In 1918, he set out on another expedition in a new ship, Maud, which lasted until 1925. He wished to explore the smaller, undiscovered areas of the Arctic Ocean. Amundsen wanted to freeze the Maud into the ice caps, and this indeed happened, but too well and they became heavily trapped. This occurred multiple times and they spent two winters frozen in ice. Amundsen broke his arm during this time and was attacked by polar bears and was of little assistance to his own men when hunting or slaying. The crew returned to Nome to fix the ship, but Amundsen's men abandoned him, furious that they had not achieved what they set out to do. Sometime afterwards, he ended up adopting two indigenous girls, four-year-old Kakunita and Camilla, but two years later he lost all his finances, sending the girls to stay with Camilla's father in eastern Russia. In 1923, he attempted to fly over the pole. Amundsen's aircraft was damaged and the journey had to be abandoned. In 1925, he accompanied Lincoln Ellsworth, taking a flying boat to go over to the north, but like the previous aircraft, got too damaged to complete the travel. In 1926, Amundsen and 15 other men managed to cross the Arctic in their airship. After an extraordinary career and successful life, Roald Amundsen mysteriously disappeared on the 18th of June 1928 whilst flying over the Arctic on a rescue mission. Amundsen's flying boat never returned, and he was never seen again, yet his legacy eternally remains. Google Earth user spots a 400-foot ice ship off the coast of Antarctica. Google Earth is a fantastic tool that almost everyone has played around with at some point, but one particular user of the app found what they claim to be a 400-foot ice ship trapped in an iceberg about 100 miles off the coast of the freezing continent. 
The impressive ice formation is said to have an uncanny similarity to a cruise ship, with lines of windows and hosts of chimneys. Immediately after the Google Earth user posted their findings, the discovery blew up online in conspiracy circles, with all sorts of theories arising as to what the large glacial object could be and how it got there. Many of those involved with the theorizing declared their belief that there is something either stuck or secretly hidden away from our sight in the continent. Certain theorists suggested things ranging from it being a secluded 1940s bunker to some long-gone civilization which, for one reason or another, disappeared. YouTube user Mr. MBB333 was the first to share the images on the platform and is a self-proclaimed Earth Watchman. Furthermore, he has allegedly been using Google Earth for the entire past decade, observing the globe, its reactions to space weather, and how the Earth's inner mechanics work. Mr. MBB333 claims to monitor the entire Earth, from seabed to the mountains to space and everything around us. The video in question reveals a huge block of ice amongst a snowy white background from the basic view, but when he switches to an in-depth 3D screen, the block of ice transforms, forming the shape of a ship which he measured out in estimates to be 4,000 feet in length. It looks like a random iceberg to the onlooker, but part of it looks like it's built with purpose, like an entryway. It does not look random, as if it had a purpose. He states also pointing out the symmetrical features which he believes must have been created, not naturally formed as certain aspects of it have crisp 90 degree angles. The video has more than 46,000 views and sparked a heavy conversation down in the comments section regarding the phenomenon. Someone in the comments claimed that it is likely something that remained from the Arctic explorations. Another commenter argued that it must be a vehicle of sorts, hidden under the ice and concealed from common sight as a bunker for the elite should a global catastrophe occur. A particular user believes that the wealthy have been going out there for about 80 years and refuse to tell the public of its existence. Until now. Another person stated that they believe that ships are built underground. Also to save the powerful elite 1% population like in the movie 2012. Many viewers of the video felt rage at the thought of astronauts, politicians, religious leaders and the rich having an elusive escape plan should a world-shattering disaster take out the majority of the common population. The most common theory though was that more investigations should be done on the continent as there might have been a secret never before known about civilization. One other person commented, much more attention needs to be given to this continent. It wasn't always frozen. Whether there is any real truth to the claims, or whether any of these theories are true, we cannot know for certain. Speculation is the best we can do until more research or investigation is done into the matter. The Jabbar Fofi Spider The Jabbar Fofi, more commonly known as the Congolese giant spider, is that of a large undiscovered species of spider that is reportedly the size of a man and having survived from a larger arachnid species found in ancient prehistoric times well into the modern day. Though larger spiders have been reported all across the continent of Africa, it appears that, within the Congo, there are native tribes known as the Baka that refer to the spider as the Jabafofi and have a reported leg span of roughly four feet long. This was uncovered after a number of African reports began telling of a massive spider infesting different African countries at different times of the year. The reported sightings of such a creature occurred back in the 1890s, when a missionary from England ventured into the country of Uganda and discovered a massive web located near Lake Nyasa. He then writes that as they were looking at the web and getting close to try to understand what it was given its massive size, stretching between two larger standing trees, several of his ports became trapped. As they began to move in the webs, sticking to the strings, they claimed spiders with legs longer than four feet began to come out and bite into the men. Later expeditions in 1938 would lead researchers to consulting with local and native tribes in the Congo that told of the Jabafofi spider that was believed to have a matching leg span of four feet in length, had thousands of eggs described as being the size of peanuts, and would nest nearby villages in efforts to trap birds, 
large animals and even humans. NASA's TESS spacecraft has spotted 2,200 new worlds. NASA almost always appears to be at the forefront of space exploration, and TESS has been another successful space mission, giving us more information about what lies beyond our planet. TESS, the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, left us here on Earth in the April of 2018 to embark upon a two-year space mission, scanning the cosmos for potential planets that lie not too far away. On a monthly basis, this spacecraft made its way to a new set of stars, positioning itself to let us observe the skies. Astronomers back on Earth eagerly awaited the results from TESS as the satellite would scan, searching for a distinctive lowering in brightness of a star. This would indicate that a planet had passed in between a star and TESS. After just two years up in space, TESS reportedly discovered 2,241 potential new exoplanets. Scientists will study these candidates and determine whether or not they truly can be classed as exoplanets, alongside numerous other profiles and views of these planets that will appear in a catalogue. Natalia Guerrero, an MIT researcher and lead author on the research paper, said, The exciting thing is to look at the map of TESS exoplanets as a kind of to-do list with 2,000 things on it. Whilst this positive attitude is exciting, a 2,000-item-long jobs list is certainly a long one. Where to start? The initial action taken in the creation of the catalogue is the long-winded task of sifting through the observations. Scientists have had to pour through 16,000 targets to decipher which alerts from TESS were planets and which were other outer space phenomena. This revealed a possible 2,241 planets. This results in a whopping number of candidate planets to be explored further, or put on Guerrero's to-do list, all of which have the potential to host alien life forms. The next step in this large-scale research was to run tests that aim to narrow down false positives, further filtering data that could be an indication of a different event in space or celestial body, as opposed to an exoplanet. This eliminated 500 of the candidate planets, proving to have been a valuable exercise. The following actions more closely reflect the already established procedures, dubbing the candidates' planets objects of interest and conducting a series of tests to confirm the planetary status of these newly discovered possible planetary bodies. This procedure is known as confirming the planet. Considerations include the size and mass of the object being evaluated to ensure they meet the minimum requirements to be considered a planet. As of yet, 120 of TESS's candidate planets in the catalogue have been determined to be planets. Not due to a high dismissal rate, but rather due to the inaccessibility of often occupied equipment. This catalogue will contribute to the research for decades to come. The vast number of candidate planets to explore followed by the confirmed planets gives a goldmine of possible research that can be conducted. Despite a huge range of research to undertake, some planets have prompted more exciting suggestions than others, stealing the spotlight, or rather the starlight, as a series of firsts have been carried out in this unique space exploration. Pi Mensi C is described as a sub-Neptune, with a thick atmosphere and was the first planetary discovery of TESS. Similarly, TOI 700D is the first planet identified by TESS that is both a comparable and approximately similar size to Earth and orbits in a habitable zone of the star within its solar system, making it a strong contender for a planet that may contain alien life. Then there are other notable discoveries which are independently astonishing, regardless as to implications for alternate life forms. DS Tuck AB has been pinned as one such planet, believed to be six times larger than Earth, though only 45 million years old, relatively young for a planet of this scale. Furthermore, LHS 3844b can complete an entire orbit of its star within 11 hours, a much shorter year than ours here on Earth. However, despite this interesting find, it is unlikely anything more than a rock in space will be uncovered here. TESS has plans to continue exploring for another two years, leaving scientists the job of connecting the dots, according to Guerrero, as more discoveries are made.
researchers keep changing their mind on how big Megalodon was. The prehistoric Megalodon was the massive great-great-great-grandfather of the sharks that lurk among beaches today. Researchers studying fossilized skeletons of the Megalodon agreed that it was undoubtedly one of the largest shark species to ever roam the ocean. However, they were previously unable to agree upon exactly how large this creature was until a recent study answered these questions once and for all. The massive beast lived from around 23 million years ago until 3 million years ago, and fossilized remains of its teeth, which are as large as human hands, have finally cracked the code in allowing scientists to definitively estimate the truly massive proportions of the megalodon. Sharks' multiple rows of teeth mean that they frequently shed them, sometimes as often as once a week, and the next tooth in the row moves forward to take its place. Since the teeth grow proportionately with the shark and on average a shark will lose 2,000 teeth in its lifetime, paleontologists at the University of Bristol and Swansea University were able to take rare fossilized megalodon teeth and compare them with teeth of modern-day species to chart a growth curve for the ancient beast. The growth curve generated mathematical calculations which were used to determine the previously undetermined proportions of the megalodon, and these proportions were mammoth indeed. The shark would have reached adult size at around 18 meters, with a tail length of an average of 4 meters and weighing upwards of 48 tons. Clocking in at more than twice the size of a modern-day great white shark, the megalodon is by far the largest shark species to have existed. Its dorsal fin alone would have been as tall as the average adult male, and the bite force behind those multiple rows of teeth was estimated to be over 10 tons, dwarfing the great white's bite strength of only 2 tons. Serrated bite marks on the fossilized bones of animals unfortunate enough to be prey to the megalodon act as a testament to the incredible strength of those jaws. The megalodon, meaning giant tooth, is aptly named. With teeth over three times the size of the great white shark, which is its closest modern-day relative. There is no doubt that those massive jaws ruled the sea in its time. The Mystery of the Seabird Ship The mythical seabird was a ghost ship found near the Newport Harbour of Rhode Island in the year 1750. Those who spotted the ship went to investigate it after the ship beached itself on Easton's Beach, but there wasn't any sign of life. The cargo remained, and according to legend, there was a kettle boiling on the stove in the ship's kitchens, with a breakfast set out on the table, untouched. Not a single thing had seemingly gone wrong. There was no trace of sickness, robbery, sea kidnapping, or violence. The belongings of the sailors were still on the seabird, and there was no sign of any rush or conflict, though one longboat was found missing, which suggested that the crew abandoned the ship in a fit of sudden panic. Folklore dictates that the captain was seen on the seabird's deck by nearby sailors, seemingly calm and steady mere hours prior to the ship's mysterious discovery. No one had any clue about what might have happened and why the crew took the lifeboat and fled, though it's not known if that happened. As with all ghost ship theories, mutiny is always considered. The legend goes on to say that after the seabird's cargo was taken off the ship by those who found it, the seabird itself faded into obscurity. Historical accounts debate this, with many era-appropriate sources claiming that what had actually happened is that the seabird was sold to a merchant who proceeded to change the seabird's name, most likely to cleanse the ship's unsolved tragedy and to give it a new slate from being recognized as the ghost ship. This was in fear that no one would purchase a cursed ship. Regardless, neither the crew itself nor the seabird were ever seen again. It's as if they faded into the morning mist. Local claims of apparitions and ghosts continued, however, and the folklore ensured the legend would live on generations down the line. In fact, it actually went on to inspire authors and works of fiction, with a story being published in a Boston newspaper in 1885, allegedly being inspired by the legend of the seabird. The story was based around mutiny. In the past, ghostly tales and claims of unsolved mysteries were far more abundant and, in many ways, far more whimsical than they are today. We have got logic and science to prove against mythical beliefs of apparitions, but one cannot help but wonder whether there is truth in those claims. 
After all, myths of ghosts and spirits have spread all over the world for as long as humans have existed. Nowadays, we can explain some of these ghost ships using theories and logic, yet there's still some that remain a mystery. The Holy Face of Genoa Throughout history, there have been many relics and paintings that are claimed to have the accurate image of Christ's face. But historians and even the most religious people take these claims with a pinch of salt. However, there is one remarkable ancient relic that has been described as the oldest portrait of Christ. Most people believe it to be the most accurate and authentic portrait of Jesus Christ. Known as the Holy Face of Genoa, this portrait is today present in the Church of St. Bartholomew of the Armenians in the town of Genoa in Italy. There is a popular ancient legend about the creation of the Holy Face of Genoa. It is believed that King Abgar of Edessa in Armenia was sick with leprosy when he heard about the miraculous healing powers of Jesus. At that time, Jesus was in Palestine. Unable to travel himself, the king sent an artist named Ananias to meet Jesus and paint a portrait of his face. However, upon reaching Jerusalem, the artist failed at his attempts to portray Jesus accurately. This is when Jesus took the canvas and rested it on his face that was covered with sweat. As a result, an image of the face of Jesus was printed on the canvas. Ananias returned to Armenia with the image and touched the king with the canvas. The king was miraculously healed from leprosy. Since that day, the shroud has been worshipped as a sacred relic. The canvas with the portrait of Jesus has since been kept in a silver gilt frame that was made during the 14th century. The Beast of Bodmin Moor Back in early 1995, the British government received more than 60 reported incidents taken from locals of Bodmin Moor, of which reported that the residents were encountering a large black panther-like creature with scraggly furs, a large powerful jaw, the muscled body of a big cat more than four feet long and black furs making it nearly impossible to see at night until the creature is close enough to attack. This led to the government starting an official investigation into the area of Bodmin Moor to try to better understand the existence of the creature and whether or not it posed a threat to the residents. Shortly after the investigation began, a skull of a leopard was found on the banks of the nearby river known as Fowey and many began to speculate that perhaps there was a never-before-seen local species of large cat in the region. These creatures were then quickly given the name the Beast of Bodmin Moor, which led many experts quickly trying to assess the situation and better understand how a leopard could have arrived in the region. Many theories and myths have started that a rich private collector could have been illegally importing the creatures that soon found themselves freed throughout the region a theory that would explain quite reasonably how the beast came to be and why it would be in open areas of Bodmin Moor. Others believe that the beast of Bodmin Moor is a direct descendant of the native wildcat species that was believed to have gone completely extinct in Britain more than a hundred years ago, but is now making a comeback. Outside of the 60 direct reports of the creature, there have been other reports of leopard calls, hissing, growling, mutilations of livestock and even missing pets that have been found half-eaten no more than a few days later. The Haunted Resurrection Cemetery A city cemetery, Resurrection Cemetery, in southwest Chicago, Illinois, is bordered by ordinary suburban housing, some forestry in the north of the cemetery, and beyond that, mostly warehouses. Resurrection isn't the most spectacular cemetery that you'll ever lay your eyes upon, and its flat, non-protruding landscape is a testament to this. However, the events and legends surrounding Resurrection Cemetery are not so plain. The legend for which the cemetery is famous for is that of the Resurrection Mary. A variation of vanishing hitchhiker folklore, the legend of the Resurrection Mary is one that wouldn't look out of place in Hollywood. It developed in the 30s, a time of growth and repair, yet also poverty and angst in America, and plays on very American horror ideals. Yet, for some, the Resurrection Mary is as real as ghost stories get. But who or what actually is the Resurrection Mary? The tale originates from a leisurely ballroom dance that took place one evening in 1934 at O'Henry Ballroom on Archer Avenue. 
the same road that Resurrection Cemetery is situated on. 20-year-old Mary Bregovi had been dancing with her boyfriend deep into the evening, as was common in the 30s. However, as can sometimes happen, the evening turned sour. At some point during the ordeal, Mary and her boyfriend got into a row and she stormed out of the ballroom. Upset, confused, and most definitely not in a state of complete mental clarity at that point, Mary fatefully stepped out into the road where she was hit by a car which resulted in her passing away. Mary was buried in the adjacent Resurrection Cemetery in her favourite white gown, and that was thought to be the sorry end to a tragic event. In 1939, a man named Jerry Pallas stopped to pick up a young female hitchhiker by the gates of Resurrection Cemetery. He noted that she was strangely quiet, but very attractive and wearing a pretty white dress. Jerry then asked the girl to dance with him at the ballroom on the same road. Once the evening was over, Jerry offered to drive the girl home. She lived on the other side of town, but they had only driven a few hundred feet down the road when she asked him to stop the car. She got out at the cemetery, thanked Jerry for the ride, and then simply vanished. Perplexed and worried about the girl, Jerry drove onto the address that the girl had originally given him to drop her off at. There, he spoke with the girl's mother and explained the events of that evening. But more than anything, the mother seemed confused. And then she said to Jerry, My daughter passed away five years ago. Some years later, Jerry spoke out about the bizarre events of that evening, saying, It was then that I understood why the woman I was dancing with that night was ice cold to the touch. I had worked in a funeral home for a while, and it was the touch of a corpse. It was some years later until the next story of the ghostly girl in white made the news. Throughout the 80s, police officers, tourists and locals all spoke of strange experiences they had had on Archer Avenue by the cemetery gates late at night. As a matter of fact, many of the stories of Resurrection Mary came from level-headed, rational men with no previous history of mental illness. That only makes it all the more creepier. The New Orleans School Haunting The existence of paranormal activity has been a hotly contested subject for centuries. For a select few, its reality is undisputed, but for others, it is simply stuff of the silver screen. However, rest assured that what you are about to hear cannot be slandered by science. The events of our second story defy the laws of logic and so can only be explained by one thing. Ghosts in late August of 2005, Hurricane Katrina was ravaging the deep south of America. From Miami to New Orleans, the storm left a visible impression on the area with upturned homes and trees felled for miles. New Orleans was by far the worst hit city on Katrina's path of destruction. Nearly 80% of the city had to evacuate to avoid Mother Nature's ensuing onslaught. However, it is believed that the storm left more than just its physical mark one a little more chilling. Amidst the raging storm, the Sophie B. Wright School, named after an avid educational philanthropist, was evacuated but also served as living quarters for some members of the National Guard who were involved in the cleanup and rescue operation. If the Guard's initial task of dealing with the fallout of one of America's most devastating recent natural disasters was not difficult enough, their experiences at the school were by no means a light relief. Many of the guards stationed at the school reported harrowing tales of transcendental activity, such as unexplained shadows and noises, but what perhaps is the most chilling of such activity was the fierce spirit of a little girl who managed to terrorise seasoned soldiers who had fought in Iraq and Afghanistan. One guard reported that whilst opening a closet of cleaning supplies, he saw the strange little girl and heard her giggling. Another guard even came face to face with a shadow whilst using the restroom, promptly causing him to flee. Events such as the aforementioned were widespread. For the guards, enough was enough, and a chaplain was called in to perform an exorcism on the school to wave away any spirits. After the visit, it seemed to be the end of the reign of the supernatural at the school, and life went back to normal. Many believe that Hurricane Katrina was an act of God to serve as punishment for humanity. As such, it also reignited the spirits of the past 
for further retribution. Whilst the exorcism may have ended the hauntings in this case, the possibility that such spirits still dwell in the school exists, as well as elsewhere in New Orleans, one of America's most haunted cities. Monte Cristo Historic Homestead Another haunted home based upon a tragedy is the Monte Cristo, built in Australia. The original homeowner and builder of this home was one Christopher Crawley. Though the tragic tale really commences when his wife, Elizabeth, took over the home in 1910 upon her husband's death. Grief-stricken at the loss of her husband, Elizabeth spent the remainder of her life within the walls of the house, leaving only twice before her death. She converted the box room into a chapel and became highly religious, turning to the Bible for comfort and support. Elizabeth was tied so closely to her home, believed to have just left twice before her death due to a burst appendix, that many think she stays there still today, as her ghost is now said to haunt the building. The death and haunting of Elizabeth Crawley appears to have been a catalyst to supernatural activity, prompting apparitions, poltergeists, unexplained noises and orbs as well as phantom-like sounds. The events that have followed the initial death include the violent death of a maid who fell from a second-floor balcony, a woman walking in a period dress seen as either a figure or silhouette, leaving blood-stained footsteps behind as she walks along the veranda, the ghost of Harold and a stable boy who lost his life due to a fire. Paranormal researchers have said that he is now thought to linger by the coach house. For 40 years, Harold had been chained up within the caretaker's cottage. He had been found lying by his mother's deceased body and was promptly sent to a home for the insane, as indelicately described at the time. Today, you will know if Harold is drawing near by the sound of chains clanking together. Marketed as the most haunted house in Australia, Monte Cristo lives on as a popular spot for thrill-seekers and believers of the supernatural to visit when in Australia with tours of the house offered each Saturday at 6pm for over 15-year-olds. This isn't a tour for the faint of heart. A tour around Monte Cristo could certainly cement your belief in the supernatural or convert you to an avid believer, if you aren't already. <laughs>